Okay, we have um, 50 uh, people joining now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, my name is Tim Moore. I'm um, at Metro Health Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio at Case Western. I'm, I'm very luckily joined tonight by Rick Bransford, um, Carlo Bella Barba, both from Harborview University of Washington in Seattle and John France, um, who is the mainstay in West Virginia University. Uh, looking at this slides, I, I noticed two things. One, I think I'm the youngest of the four of us, but it, it, I look like I'm the oldest. I don't know what that means. Just don't think it means that I, I, I know more. And no, and the other thing is, is no one beats a John France stash, that's for sure. Um, but seriously, the people who are listening here, these three guys are my go-tos. If I don't know what I'm doing, which I find it uh, way too often, these are the people that I uh, call on the phone, I text them. So have people, I, and I've only been doing this 20 years. So have people who you can go to when you come up with these difficult types of injuries. Um, these are our disclosures, nothing pertinent to this talk. And just some general generalities with Zoom etiquette. All your microphones have been muted and the videos are turned off. If you want us to look at your questions, uh, drop them in the Q&A. Uh, John, Rick, or Carlo, one of us will um, uh, try to answer those. Uh, chat is a function for the faculty only. So we were, we're going to start, but as we start, um, uh, this is just an agenda here, so welcome introductions. Uh, Dr. Bella Barba, who um, I believe is in the OR right now, um, was going to run through uh, sacral fracture classification, just a quick presentation of that. Um, and then once that's done, Dr. Branford is going to go through tips and tricks of reducing these very difficult sacral fractures. And then we'll go through case presentations. So saying that, if Carlo's not there, um, I apologize to the audience because some people, uh, um, they just tune in to hear Carlo uh, talk. But I'm going to run through uh, the sacral, uh, the AO sacral fracture classification. I believe this was back in 2016, 2017. Um, and it just follows the entire AO classification. Uh, uh, A is uh, tend to be somewhat stable uh, injuries in compression. B is uh, um, kind of extension injuries or failure of tension bands. And C's are you know, the devastating injuries. So real quick, type A1, these are fractures, but they're not really um, significant. So these are like TP fractures uh, in the thoracolumbar lumbar spine or the cervical spine. So A1s, there are fractures there. They're usually below uh, the level of bowel and bladder uh, uh, control and issues. So uh, just because everyone gets scanned stem, from, uh, stem to stern. So these are non-contributory kind of lateral lower sacral fractures. A2, uh, now we're getting it more into the uh, midpoint of the sacrum. These fractures usually go through somewhere below, uh, lower S2 or upper S3, and these can have some issues with um, bowel and bladder issues. And then A3s are obvious uh, displaced fractures. So these are uh, fractures, usually transverse axial fractures through the body of the sacrum. And again, the majority of these fractures uh, about 80% of these fractures occur somewhere between the S1, S2 residual disc and the S3 body. So A3s are more displaced, just higher energy and more displacement. Um, A3s, uh, if there is bowel and bladder issues, you know, uh, it can be decided to fix these fractures. Oftentimes when these fractures come in, I tell these patients the neurologic injury you have is probably the neurologic injury you're gonna be left with, but we consider offering surgery for type A3 fracture depending on what else is going on with the patient, polytrauma status. So these are uh, B fractures, uh, posterior vertical pelvic fractures. So these kind of go along with the old Denis classification, zone one, zone two, and zone uh, three fractures. So B1 fractures uh, tend to be somewhat mechanically stable and tend not to produce a lot of neurologic issues. B1 fractures are through the mid portion of the sacrum. B2 are usually lateral to the neural foramina and B3 are within the neural foramina. So whereas the knee classification one was outside lateral to the foramina, two was within the foramina and three was medial, 
B1, B2, and B3, they're, they're a little bit different now with this classification. And there's not significant displacement here. That's the key, because as you get into higher level fractures, you'll see that there is significant neurologic injuries. So um, again, B, these are vertical uh, fractures. Uh, it's like the pelvis opening up somewhat through the sacrum. Um, and the higher level you go at these, the more there is neurologic issues. Um, B1, okay, central longitudinal sacral fracture, usually medial. Okay, these are good x-rays of that right through the middle. And we'll actually go over uh, a B1 fracture uh, in the discussion. B2 are usually lateral to the sacral foramina, um, only a 2% chance of neurologic injury. And if you, if you think about where the L5 nerve root passes over the sacral ala, this is usually the, one of the exit point, points for the fracture. And therefore, that's why it kind of has its own de uh, designation. So B2 fractures can be fixed with transsacral screws. Um, usually, this doesn't involve uh, disruption, vertical displacement of the hemi pelvis. So, oftentimes, our orthopedic traumatologists or people like John France, uh, who does orthopedic traumatology as much as spine trauma, fix these with transsacral screws. Um, B3, so th this is the worst prognosis of the um, uh, B type of injuries, but there's still very low chance of um, neurologic injuries. Yeah, 6% chance, so less than 10% chance. So again, B2 are like the tension band, the failure uh, of the pelvis opening up through the sacrum, B1, B2, and B3. Okay, C fractures, these are the ones, these are, tend to be the pure uh, sacral fractures. So these are the ones where if you think of the spine and the sacrum and the pelvis as a long bone, so this is a disruption. So these are pure sacral injuries. And again, they usually uh, occur between the uh, uh, discs of S1 and S2 and down in the body of S3. So these are high energy. It's usually a flexion moment. And, and these are the uh, what we used to just classify as the U, the delta, and the lambda type of sacral fractures. So C2, you can have bilateral uh, spinal pelvic injuries. Obviously, if you have this much disruption, you're going to have disruption through the pubic symphysis, symphysis anteriorly. So um, this could have been classified as a U or an old type uh, H fracture, as you see. Uh, um, in the lower C3 injury. So higher energy mechanism and a higher chance of neurologic injury with these C type of fractures. So these I consider more along with AO classification as fracture dislocations. Um, C0 uh, as we see, and then we have um, different types of treatment options for these. Again, often, oftentimes transsacral screws or iliolumbar fixation. C1 uh, usually involves the 5-1 uh, facet. That's the mechanical disruption and through the uh, uh, sacral foramina. Um, again, can have vertical displacement of the hemipelvis, um, disruption through the anterior pubic symphysis. And then we tend to offer surgery both for prevention or further progression of neurologic injury or just as a stabilization component to the pelvis. Um, C3, these are the true H fractures, okay, that, as described before, usually involve significant neurologic injury. Okay, sacral fractures come in various types, degrees, um, important to classify injuries. One, and as you'll see, you'll get two, maybe two different comments about if, if, if a patient presents to me with a sacral fracture and they have a neurologic injury and the sacrum is significantly displaced, a higher energy injury like a C fracture, I'm gonna do my best to reduce the sacrum and stabilize it. But I tend to tell the patient, you know, your neurologic injury you have when you landed 40 feet from the fifth story is probably what you're gonna be left with. So, but I think it's important that we recognize these, classify these, treat these appropriately to prevent further neurologic injury. These are the things you wanna avoid the patients developing uh, late bowel and bladder issues. Okay, so with that, again, I apologize. Carlo would have made it much uh, uh, nicer and more involved, but we will go to um, uh, Rick Bransford now. He's gonna tell us some, show us some tips and tricks to reduce sacral fractures. All right, let me uh, switch over here and uh, share my screen.
Uh, pardon me. Is that showing up okay for everyone? Can everybody see that okay? Tim, is that coming through? Yes, it is. Okay. So um, what I want to talk, touch on briefly, and, and again, I, I have to say that my, my philosophy on this is, has changed uh, significantly um, since I first started managing these. Uh, historically, my, my, my perspective was just, you know, I just need to get some instrumentation there, and, and it is what it is. And I guess I've sort of changed my philosophy on that. So um, here's my disclosures. Tim already went over there, so really nothing that should be relevant. And, and I think as we kind of look at, you know, classically sort of some of the stuff that was sort of this was deemed to be treated, um, I think we've gotten a lot better than this. And, you know, we look at transilio transsacral screw, we look at our lumbopelvic fixation, even more recently, as we look at our transition to percutaneous stuff, um, we've become a lot better. And I think that this makes a difference in terms of our, our patient's outcomes. Hey, Rick, Rick yeah. you're in presentation mode, so we can see the slides, but they're kind of small. Let me try and switch that over. I apologize. <laughs> Is that coming across uh, better I, now? Yeah, thanks for thanks for telling me. <clears throat> it always shows up differently. Wait a minute. We we are there. We go. Perfect. It's good. Okay, so I, I think when we sort of um, you know look at these today, you know we got you know certain as Tim just described, you know the C type injuries that we sort of see here. Um, and, and our goal is really that, you know, again, I, I historically didn't really fully appreciate is that we need to reduce these. We wanna reduce kyphosis, you know, everything's about sagittal balance. We wanna realign translation um, that ideally will line up the canal and whatever neural elements may be, may be compressed. And then lastly, we wanna sort of decompress the canal and, and address all of those. And again, you know, as, as I just mentioned, you know, everything these days is about sagittal balance. And so we really wanna work aggressively to help restore that sagittal balance that, you know, everybody talks about when they talk about deformity. Now, really, when we sort of look at the um, various options we have here, I think that the simplest thing is sort of traction and you can just put some uh, femoral traction pins in. And ideally, this will help to sort of pull the, um, if you will, the pelvis away from the spine. They can help reduce that to some degree, relatively simple. And with, um, as you can see this patient here, you can hang 30 pounds or so on each of the uh, uh, femora and then can hopefully gain some distraction. Second, you can use something like this, a femoral distractor with a chance pin of the iliac wing. So if you look at this picture here, this is coming down into the pedicle. This pin here is going out into the iliac wing and you can just gradually distract that and that can help to get length, can uh, aid with alignment and you can use that, that to leverage that. Moving to kind of some other options here, um, you can put a chance pin, uh, you can put it in the proximal fragment and try and use that as a joystick. You can put a chance pin in the distal fragment and use that as a joystick. And that those can kind of help to unlock, you know, a bone piece that may be incarcerated and help to get things realigned. I think this is maybe not so good for reducing uh, kyphosis or restoring sagittal balance, but it can help if you're trying to disimpact pieces and maybe help to decompress the canal a little bit better. Another option is <clears throat> if you do a laminectomy or sort of get in there laterally, you can stick cobs down into the uh, fracture. And sometimes these are sort of broad enough that you can kind of just disimpact that fracture as well. And again, that can be a, an aid to help um, uh, disimpact this, re, re, uh, help restore your alignment. And that can be another trick. I think the most powerful trick though is really to just stick in your screws, you know, whether you decide to go up to L5 or L4, stick in your iliac screws, then use an insight you bender, use a distractor, and that can not only help you to restore sagittal balance, but also to disimpact the fracture. 
I will say that from my own experience that if you do use an insight tube bender, it's usually helpful to change out those rods once you sort of get them. So, you know, stick your rods in, do all your reductions, and then one by one, change them out left side, right side. Because I think with those insight tube benders, you get a bit of an acute kink in the rod, and that can cause um, some weakening of the rod. I had uh, a patient or two that, that then fractured their rod relatively early. Um, I think also here may be an opportunity to use stronger rods. If you use uh, titanium or cobalt chrome, maybe use the titanium aluminum nitro, uh, nitrous alloy ones that are a little bit stronger um, to try and hold this while those uh, sticky um, bloody bone pieces stick together. So again, you know, going back to this fracture, you know, we can uh, reduce kyphosis, we can realign translation, we can decompress the canal. Um, and in this particular patient, you know, I tried essentially most of those tricks in the book to try and get this realigned. You can still see it's not perfect. But I do think that likely the most important thing is to really try and reduce that kyphosis and try and pull that sacrum back um, up on top or the, the proximal component of the sacrum with respect to the distal and really focus significantly on that sagittal balance. These patients may be able to tolerate it okay uh, in their early years, but uh, as they get older, I think they're a little bit less tolerant of that. And um, as we see in all of our deformity pit cases. So again, I think this demonstrates that we can reduce the kyphosis we can generally realign translation. We can get the canal decompressed. You can see the laminectomy there behind. And you know that's sort of about as be the best we can get. Another thing that um, I think we need to be uh, care pay careful attention to, and for somebody like John who does his own um, uh, pelvic fixation, if there's an associated anterior ring, acetabular fracture, whatever, once you lock them in with lumbopelvic fixation, uh, really nothing's going to move that well. And if you do your lumbopelvic before somebody has their acetabular component fixed, your, your acetabular surgeons are going to be very unhappy with you. So really there's an order to doing this. Ideally, you fix the anterior ring first and the acetabulum. You then uh, achieve, you know, frequently in concert with your pelvic surgeon, get the length you want, obtain your realignment of your posterior pelvic ring. And once all that's sort of achieved, uh, then you can stabilize posteriorly either with lumbopelvic alone or with some sort of combination of lumbopelvic with uh, transilio transsacral screws. I think, you know, these days we can do a lot more with a little bit less. You know, previously when we used to do these bigger incisions on the midline with these people that had these morale lesions, um, they had a lot a higher incidence of complications with wound breakdown and stuff. Whereas now we can do a lot more um, if we use some of these techniques through closed means and then use some sort of percutaneous instrumentation such as this demonstrates where um, we get a reduction, our uh, colleagues place a transilio transsacral screw, and then we're able to place some uh, percutaneous um, uh, lumbosacral fixation with four stab incisions without having to do a, a big exposure to this. And if you look at this, is this is one that had unilateral, and you can see in this picture here that we can kind of get access to that, which is two very small poke holes threading the rod through as we do with some of the other uh, percutaneous stuff. So it really is a lot less morbid for, our, uh, for the patients who already have significant pelvic injuries. So I would say that, you know, my take home message is, you know, don't, don't just fix these, uh, reduce them. Um, typically, I think it's the B3s and the C fractures that need these the most, occasionally the B2s. When we look at all the other fractures we take care of in the spine or, or in the extremities, you know, we have certain principles we follow, we align, we, uh, we decompress, we obtain sagittal balance, and so we want to maintain these principles and uh, stick, to the, stick to these. There's a lot of tools out there from uh, traction to, you know, various um, uh, shant spin joysticks. Um, I think the most powerful thing is our lumbopelvic fixation that we can then realign even in situ. So I don't know if John or Tim, you have other tips or other ways you kind of say this is really your go-to when all else fails um, as you're trying to reduce these or what principles you use. But uh, John, what thoughts do you have? I, I wrote down a couple things because that, that's great. I mean, those are all the things I do. You know, we, you have to, we have to realize that when we have these sacral U fractures and they're in kyphosis, it's changed the pelvic incidence. So this is the only way to change pelvic incidence is with sacral osteotomies or a, a sacral U or H fracture. And essentially you change your pelvic incidence. And if you increase the kyphosis by 20 or 30 degrees, that patient's going to have to increase their lumbar lordosis to compensate for that increase in pelvic incidence. So it, it has a significant effect on the lumbar spine uh, to stand upright. They're going to have to lordose quite substantially. And that's the other thing is, I think, as we think about these, 
most of these we've talked about so far have been all high energy young patients. And I think there's two categories. There's this category, and then there's the elderly insufficiency fractures, which are different, many of which can be treated non-operatively. Those are the ones when they're really painful and the patient won't mobilize, they're almost ideal for percutaneous fixation because usually displacement's not a big deal, it's just stabilization. And then the other issue I wanted to bring up is the soft tissue injury. A lot of these high energies have significant morale of L injuries. They necrose the skin. Um, so, you know, sometimes we have to open them if we can work through smaller incisions percutaneously. Some of the trick tricks showed. I like to put shant pins in the iliac wing and then I'll take a large carbon fiber bar from the external fixator set to up my lever arm. So I'll have a pin in and then I'll have a long lever arm that I can take on both sides to rock the pelvis into kyphosis and then lock down my fixation to help with the reduction, particularly if I'm trying to do it through little incisions because of the soft tissue injury, which a lot of times end up, ends up being one of the bigger problems. So John, in your experience, what, what percentage in, in today's era do you feel that you need to open? And of course, you know, everybody's going to see a, a different component of, you know, the severe with, you know, severe kyphosis or whatever versus whatever. But um, what's your sense of how many you're treating open versus percutaneously these days? Probably 20% open. And it depends what I mean. I, it's, it's not uncommon for me now to use your Cobb trick. And so I'll try to get my reduction with lever, with the shans pins levering the pelvis, maybe traction, um, and some of the tricks you showed with my rods percutaneously, but it's not uncommon to make a midline incision directly over to decompress it if I need to, and then to, and then to use that little incision to get a cob in there and help, because you have to disengage these things to get, get them to correct. So I'll sometimes make a small midline incision, but my fixation will be percutaneously. Tim, you're on mute. Do you have other tricks that you use? You're still on mute. I, I, I think the point of, you know, your, your basic orthopedic principles in any fracture, you know, exaggeration of the injury, longitudinal traction, and then a reduction maneuver are very important. What, and I tell patients if it's a if, if it's a hundred displaced fracture that I'm going to reduce, and they have a soft tissue injury, I tell them right up front, you know, this may need multiple operations and washouts to to get things to heal. Because I think Rick, even in your study, which I think is one of the largest studies, your the infection rate was like close to thirty percent. That's when you were opening everything. So I think if you tell that patient up front. There's, there was even one with a very bad soft tissue injury that I put a wound back on, on the initial operation. Um, I, I think another trick is sometimes you don't need two iliac bolts, but oftentimes I'll put an, another iliac bolt on each side and then place a rod percutaneous through that and then grab that rod with large rod holders. And that way you have much better control of the distal fragment. And then if you have control of the proximal fragment, you can, you can maneuver that 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 hem that pelvis or that hemi pelvis uh, with those big rod holders. So I mean, and again, you know, these these are very bad, devastating injuries. We're talking to John French and uh, Rick Branchard. So you know, we, we probably do maybe three or four of these a year that we tend to end up treating at my institution. So you know, it, it's just over the last several years learning from our mistakes um, how to better treat these things. Uh, but excellent, excellent talk on, on how to get these things reduced, Rick. But I, I do think that, you know, with our advent of more kind of percutaneous stuff, I think our pelvic surgeons, you know, again, I, I don't do the other pelvis stuff like John does. I think they're much more uh, quick to call on us because, you know, certainly the biomechanics of lumbopelvic fixation far exceeds that of transilio transacral screws. And when we had to whack them wide open and, you know, had a 30% infection rate, you know, that was a different deal. But now if you can just sort of, you know, in an hour stick in four screws percutaneously, that's a game changer. And so I think we're doing, you know, maybe historically we were doing, you know, five to 10 a year. I'd say now we're doing closer to 20 because, because they realize that we're not as, as morbid as we used to be. Yeah. And, and John, may, maybe you can comment on this, but, you know, that one transsacral screw, you know, I don't like to see that as definitive fixation for these injuries because there's, that still allows some rotation. 
I mean, you get a lateral view of that screw and it's bending, true, but I like to see two SI screws in that either if that S1 corridor or that S2 corridor, because that just biomechanically is much stronger. And I will be more aggressive with my orthopedic traumatologist if I see that one transsacral screw. I'll say, well, let me, you know, put a, put a, a screw in L4 and drop an iliac bolt just for, you know, uh, added fixation. Yeah, certainly the like the type B fractures that are associated with like a vertical shear fracture of the pelvis. Um, most of those we do lumbopelvic fixation yep. on. So it'll yep. get reduced. A lot of times it'll get reduced with either external fixator, plating in the front, and then a trans iliac or an iliosacral screw. And then either that same sitting, you know, or we'll come back and flip them prone and put in lumbopelvic fixation. When we do that, it's almost always percutaneously. Yeah. You'll see those vertical shears, they'll displace on one, one iliosacral screw. And if you try to fix a sacral U with it, you'll see the, the whole weight of the spines pushing down through the pelvis. That, that slide that, that was in the beginning of uh, Carlo's talk that shows the forces, they're, they're then pushing down through the sacrum and you'll see that transiliac transsacral screw just bow. And so unless you protect that with some lumbopelvic fixation, you know, they tend to displace. Great. I think equally too, though, you know, if you just treat them with a transiliary transsacral, uh, our pelvis guys tend to keep them non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing. Whereas once you put in lumbopelvic, they can weight bear as tolerated. Yeah, yeah. I've become much more aggressive letting them weight bear now. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we're gonna, it's um, 8.30, we're gonna run through some cases now. Uh, real quick, I just wanna put up the learning objectives. Uh, you should be able to describe the different types of sacral fractures from Carlo's talk. Demonstrate understanding of methods to reduce sacral fractures. Um, I think Rick was very good in explaining that. And then employ surgical strategies in treating sacral fractures. And again, again this is, these are usually, you know, polytrauma patients. We're not talking about the sacral insufficiency fractures, but these are usually high energy polytrauma patients. You're going to have to be, if you're a neurosurgeon, you're going to have to talk to your orthopedic traumatologist. If you do purely spine, like most of us do, you got to have a good relationship with timing of how to fix the pelvic ring injury and then adding the uh, lumbar, lumbar sacral fixation. Okay. So those are the two young guys. So the first case here, can everyone hear me? Okay. And see the slides, everything. I want to make sure. Yep. Good. Okay. Right. This is a 19 year old, healthy um, female who maybe wasn't making a good lifestyle uh, decision. Um, she was a pedestrian versus car struck. It was high speed. She landed on her buttocks about 20, 25 feet from the point of impact. It was an isolated injury. Um, she was transferred uh, to our institution post-trauma day number four, um, searing right leg pain. Just, just uh, she wouldn't allow anyone to touch or manipulate her right leg. She had zero out of five right plantar flexion. Otherwise, she was neurologically intact, normal uh, rectal tone, normal bowel and bladder function. She came to us without a Foley. So this is an axial CT scan uh, through uh, the sacrum. Uh, the, the SI joints are okay, but you can see this disruption of the sacrum more so on the right side, but definitely uh, disruption. Uh, this is a pure, uh, but you can see the right S1 foramen is extremely closed down here. This one is not normal, uh, but it's, it's much more open. And so this uh, fracture morphology corresponded with her presentation and her clinical presentation, again, searing right leg pain, zero out of five plantar flexion. This is uh, a, a sagittal view again. So if you go to the two, you have this injury through the axial and then the sagittal, this is a pure U sacral fracture. Um, this is gonna a video just showing a, um, uh, a coronal uh, video through the sacrum. You see it, it's uh, medial to the, uh, sacral foramina, but goes through the sacral foramina on, on the um, right side. So 19 year old female, isolated injury, right leg pain. And then this is just a 3D reconstruction, um, which shows the disruption uh, through the uh, uh, top of the sacrum at S1 down through S2. Um, doesn't show the foramina well, but you can uh, get the uh, idea that uh, the disruption here. So 
we're going to pull up our first polling question. Uh, you'll see the options there for those um, participating. Uh, our treatment options here. Um, Non-op with close follow-up because, as we know, the people who deal with this, traumatic radiculopathy tends to get predictably better. Okay, Traumatic radiculopathy uh, oftentimes is not a, a, an indication uh, to offer surgery. And, and it, traumatic radiculopathy, especially if it's a, if it's in one uh, a dermatome, myotome, tends to get predictably better when the fracture heals. So that's the first option. Who wants to do a posterior isolated right S1 for amenotomy? This is a 19-year-old. You know, uh, she has this isolated injury, uh, right S1 radiculopathy. Who wants to just go posteriorly and do an S1 for amenotomy? Who wants to do a posterior L5 S1 decompression infusion, instrumentation, inner body, and for amenotomy, just kind of like a degenerative L5 S1 case with bad S1 radiculopathy, uh, maybe not such a bad option. Posterior iliolumbar instrumentation with right S1 for amenotomy, hardware removal once the fracture is healed. That's an option here as D. And your last option, who wants to go anteriorly? You know, that, that S1 frame is right there anteriorly. Uh, decompress the S1 frame and from the front, and then go posterior L5 to S1 with an instrumented fusion. So we will give um, a, a couple of minutes for people to log in. Hey, Rick, keep an eye on the chat or, or the Q&A, okay? Well, um, yeah. Um, so let me know. Um, I just gave the answer of what I did. Uh, but let me know when we have um, our our questions somewhat in. Okay, so yeah, 60% six, uh, want to do a posterior or lumbar instrumentation with right S1 for amenotomy, hardware removal once the fracture is healed. Uh, yeah, I, I don't dive in the front on these. I know people who have tried and it's, uh, it can be a disaster. Um, I think not close non-operative treatment in this is a reasonable option. I would just be very concerned about the energy and mechanism. Okay, she didn't fall, you know, a few feet off of her porch under her butt. This is a high energy injury. And, you know, at the time of the trauma, she has this kyphosis through S, um, S2. So let's, um, this is what I did. And I, I put this in intentionally because I don't like this. Okay. I did this about 11 years ago. And if this patient presents to me now, I would do this construct much different. So we did pedicle screws in L4 and L5, um, bilateral iliac bolts, and then a, a transverse rod connecting the iliac bolts. And then we connected our lumbar instrumentation with the iliac through connectors. Okay. So this, this here is just a, a, a rod here with a, um, a connector to the transverse. I don't really like this uh, fixation because it would still have a tendency to rotate. Uh, even those are, those are caps and they are, um, you know, um, uh, torqued to, the, to that transverse rod. I, I would, uh, now if this presents, I would do probably just an L4 pedicle screw and iliac bolt and rods connecting directly and not through this mechanism here. Um, John, Rick, what do you think? Did you fuse her? No. And so, so uh, real quick, we'll just go through this and then I'll ask you. So this is her post-op CT scan. We did an extensive uh, S1 foramen uh, We followed it. Uh, the, the S1 foramen is really, really, really deep, um, but we got to it as much as we could from the back. We opened it up. Her radiculopathy actually got much worse for about six weeks after her surgery. She couldn't put her foot down on the floor, but we loaded it up with Neurontin and then it quickly went away. So this is with the fracture healed. And then I go in and I take this instrumentation out. That's an, that's an important point. I, I generally don't fuse them. So I usually in these, in the insufficiency fractures cause they're older, I tend to leave it in. Yeah. Um, but in younger patients, I usually remobilize the lumbar spine whether I went to L4 and L5 or just L5, depending on severity of the injury. Uh, because we had a question in the Q&A that maybe you guys can address also that I'll sometimes put screws four and five, sometimes just five, depending on the severity. Um, but I tend to remobilize the spine and take it out partly to remobilize it, but also 
when you put iliac screws in percutaneously, you tend to put them in a kind of an ideal place and they do tend to be prominent and bother people. And so yeah. most of the time they're happy to get them out. Yeah. And John I've, John, I've learned that in my patients, if the hardware doesn't bother them, they never come back. But then they come back six years later and they've trashed their lower lumbar spine. Their L5 S1 space is completely trashed. So I intentionally leave the iliac bolts prominent. So it bothers the people. You only need six to eight months. Okay. You're a mean guy. Well, <laughs> my patients may think I do that, but it's not intentional. <laughs> but Rick, comment, comment on the construct. Yeah, no, I uh, I think it's pretty rare that you have to go up to L4. You know, I think normally you can get down, you know, just to L5, S1. You know, again, I think for most of these, you know, and, and Thomas Schildhauer's biomechanical studies show that, you know, if you put a transiliary transacral screw in and associated with that, it's really quite strong and quite and quite robust. And they can weight bear as tolerated. I think certainly the older people who have, you know, a significant trauma, but have, you know, poor bone, you know, then there's maybe a role to go L4, L5 and ilium. But I think to, you know, as you already stated, to get a, a continuous rod from your lumbar, lumbar pedicle screws down to your iliac screws is better. I actually, you know, I think that there's an ideal BMI for these. Obviously we all hate the 50 BMI, but I think, you know, if you look at in a recent study we did, our average BMI for these um, C-type injuries was about 21 to 22. And so these people were so skinny and that's probably why they had these C-type injuries is because they didn't have any padding. They didn't have their built-in airbags that, uh, you know, bigger people have that maybe protect them to some degree. I, I try and, you know, really try and stick my iliac screws quite low profile, you know, below the PSIS um, so that they're not as prominent. But, you know, it's a bit of a game, particularly if you're doing it percutaneously, because, you know, very frequently I'll have my tower coming off. I'll stick my rod in, you know, take it off and go, wow, this is still too prominent. We'll load up everything, take out the rod, sink down the screw another centimeter or so, check again. But it's really a palpation test. And of course, even at this time, they're, they're swollen. And so it's you don't quite know how they're going to be you know, a month down the road. But I try and try and sink them, and you know, usually my ideal screw is an eight by one hundred out into each iliac wing. But I think for most of these, we can stop at L five. I rarely fuse. Yeah. I think there was a question about, you know, what if there's an L five S one facet injury? If there's a significant fracture on those, you know, I'll, I'll try and I, I will fuse those and be more inclined to leave those in. But I think that there's a whole number of different patterns. I think some of those fractures will go on to heal um, as well. So that's a bit of a um, you know, one case at a time type of thing. I don't have a hard and fast rule on that. Certainly older versus younger. Um, how bad is the fracture? Those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, I'll fuse it if it's a facet injury. Sometimes it's not the screw head that's prominent. It's the end of the rod. Right. So the curve and the, you know, when you curve the rod, it, it's approaching the surface and you have to have enough rod sticking out of the bottom of the tulip head so it doesn't disengage. Sometimes it's that prominent end of the rod that's actually prominent. Uh, John, yeah. Rick, comment. Um, would you encourage um, an SI screw here, or uh, because uh, with, I, I usually my, do. So I like my, my, at my institution, pure sacral fractures. The orthopedic traumatologists say it's it, it's yours, so they don't they don't want anything to do with it. I I tend to like different points of fixation in different directions. I think if I can, you know, add that screw, it's a different direction of fixation. So I feel like biomechanically. Right. It improves the situation. And a lot of times I've actually done that before I put my spinal pelvic fixation in because I've done something in the front and I put, I put the transiliac transacral or bilateral uh, iliosacral screws, depending on what their anatomy will allow. And then I'm usually putting the, the posterior fixation in secondarily in a lot of these. It, it partly depends what I'm doing. If, I'm, if I have a displaced one like Rick showed, that patient's probably going to be prone for the whole case. And so I would probably use my spinal pelvic fixation to get fixation. But at the end, I would put a transiliac transacral screw in just as a different direction of fixation. And that was my question. Would you stay away from the right side? Because that's where she has the steering. Or you don't, as long as you have a good window, usually. I think it depends screen. on the window. Okay. Some people, you can't use a transiliac transacral okay. screw. The corridor straight across isn't amenable. You have to use iliosacral screws and you can aim posterior to anterior to be in a safe corridor. Okay. But then, then I might put bilateral iliosacral screws in to get in a better corridor, but I do like to use a transiliac transacral if their anatomy will allow it. Sometimes you can't put it at S1, but you can put it at S2. S2. Okay. 
Okay. So you guys, how long do you keep the hardware in and when do you do, do you do a CT scan? Do you, you know, radiate these, you know, people again uh, to check for fracture healing? Do you go on x-rays? What do you do to determine if it's okay to take the hardware out and when? I CT them at the six month visit. So when they come for their six month visit, I have a CT arranged for that day. I CT them and if it's healed, I start working them on the schedule. So it's usually between six and eight months that I take it out. Rick? Uh, yeah, same thing. I, I, you know, we, we, whenever anybody has any sort of sacral injury, we always work in concert with our pelvic team. They're usually the first point of call and they'll usually call us for, for help. Um, we always let them put their screw in first. You know, there's a lot of leeway in terms of where we put our iliac screws, whereas they have a very narrow corridor. So if we go first, we can kind of stick it right in their way. And then suddenly they can't get their transilio transsacral screw. So, you know, we, we let them go first. Once they're sort of satisfied that they've done what they can, then we kind of come in and provide the backup for them. But I think if you sort of jump in there first and just sort of randomly put in your iliac screws, you can really sort of uh, block their corridors or get in the way of where they want to stick their screws. Yeah, I agree. All right. So let's um, move on to the next case. 47-year-old male fall from 40 feet. No motor, no sensory to his lower extremities, no rectal tone. He shows up in the trauma bay four hours after the injury, and there's an isolated TL and sacrum injuries. So 47 year old fall from height, uh, gets to your trauma dip at bay quickly. I don't know how this patient got so quickly. So this is a sagittal video. So it shows a significant L1, you can call it an A4, you can call it a C, but L1, A4 uh, uh, fracture with actually there's some posterior uh, uh, involvement there. So I would call it a C. And then you see a very typical, uh, but kind of blown apart S2 fracture, okay? So an axial through the L1, you see a sagittal split at T12, and then L1 is where the business is. This is why, um, you know, this is concerning because of his neurologic uh, status. Isolated injury, head, chest, abdomen is fine. He's alert, awake, talking. And then a... Uh, axial vid through the sacrum. I want you to notice the left sacral ala there because that will have implications and uh, issues for me down the road. Again, an axial through the sacrum. Hi. All right. So, so let's go to our next pulling question. Right our treatment options. Do we want to do an MRI of the thoracal lumbar and sacrum and treatment based on the findings? So again, four hours after his injury, L1, um, no motor, no sentry. We can't call it Asia A yet because again, this is, um, uh, it's not the cervical spine and we're not 72 hours after our injury. So do you want to do an MRI of his thoracal lumbar and sacrum treatment based on the OR findings? Do you want to take the patient to the operating room for de decompression and fusion of the L1 injury? You want to admit him to the ICU, maintenance of MAPS. You know, uh, there's no data, but we extrapolate it from head injury data. Keep his pressures up, 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury for 72 hours. Reassess, uh, you know, a, a Q hour and decide later. Or you want to go to the OR for decompression fusion of L1, definitive fixation uh, of his sacrum. So, again, you know, it's... Um, you know, there's no hyperacute, uh, but you know, you're getting this guy, uh, this patient within, you know, fairly er uh, quickly within four hours of his injury, uh, significant L1 injury, but also sacral fracture. So let's um, let's see what people decide. Oh yeah, they, well they were treated a few weeks ago. Who's that? Whose microphone is that? Okay. So a little bit mixed. So I, I kind of like it because I don't know if there is any one right injury here. So um, the winner is uh, to OR for decompression and fusion of L1, definitive fixation of his sacrum. Um, that's 41%, a close second is MRI first, uh, and treatment based on the findings. Um, uh, a, a sort of a distant third is to, to OR for definitive treatment of the L1 injury. And then no one wants to sit on them and wait. Uh, they want to do something, uh, whether it be image or image and soon OR, but not wait on them for 72 hours. So this is what we did 
uh, urgently. Okay, so we, we took him to the OR, uh, did uh, anterior L1 corpectomy. Now this is completely my bias. There's no data to support going anterior with this, though I'll argue you can get away with fewer fusion levels if you, do, if you treat patients uh, with anterior corpectomies. So urgent anterior L1 corpectomy, uh, structural cage, and then we flipped them and did um, uh, L1, or I'm sorry, T11 uh, to um, L2 definitive fixation, did not fix his sacrum, okay? Did not fix him, his sacrum in that setting. Uh, doing anterior corpectomies acutely, it can be a little bit bloody. I think we lost about two or 300 cc's of blood. So um, um, we um, did this definitive fixation of his L1 injury, and then we took him back to the uh, ICU. I wanted to see if his neuro neurologic exam changed. Um, again, it's not likely to in the acute setting like this, but it could. Again, I don't, I, I, I'm sure his sacral fracture was contributing to his loss or lack of rectal tone, but I just wanted to see if his neurologic exam changed after we decompressed uh, his conus. I don't do MRIs if the clinical exam uh, follows the CT findings, but about hospital day or post-op day four or five, I believe, that's when um, uh, the orthopedic traumatologist and myself took him to the OR. Uh, he, I didn't show you his anterior, um, um, anterior column uh, acetabular fracture, but transsacral screw through S1 and then L5 uh, bilateral pedicle screws and iliac bolts uh, for his sacrum. So that's what happened. And then uh, again, at six, he was a little slow to heal. I, I did a CT scan, I think it was about seven months and I wasn't too sure. I had him go back to see the orthopedic traumatologist. They agreed. They said, you know, I'm not sure this uh, fracture is healed yet. So he was a little bit later. He got another CT scan at 13 months and then removal of hardware uh, after that. So he healed his um, uh, sacral fracture predictably. But now going back to that uh, video, he has a left foot drop. He has global lower extremity weakness, okay? Global lower extremity weakness, but he has nothing in left dorsiflexion um, or EHL. So, and my concern is I, I wasn't, he had the outside CT and I wasn't able, but this is still kicked out. I'm sure that L5 nerve root is either on stretch or, um, it was lacerated or it's very rare, but it could have been interrupted during the injury. So uh, she has a complete L5 um, left-sided neuropraxia and foot drop on the left side. He's globally weak, but he walks with uh, uh, just a cane now. He doesn't have real good stamina. He, ha he has his bowels and bladder back. So my question, uh, one, would you do things differently, you guys? And what would you do anything about his uh, left lower extremity? Uh, I mean, I think in, initially getting into this would be a bloody, awful mess. And, you know, sometimes when we've, we've had to open them, and I used to open more, um, sometimes you see the rootless, they're floating in the breeze, the torn roots. And it may very well be this five root is torn in this area. Uh, I, I don't think you're going to be able to see it meaningfully. Redu I mean, you know, if you have a simple fracture pattern, sometimes reducing it helps. You can even entrap the root in it. Yeah. You, you don't know because you're not typically looking at the root across the ava. So that's always one of the fears is you'll actually entrap the root by trying to pull pieces into it. So I, I think it's hard to do much about that, quite frankly. Uh, yeah. I don't know how Rick feels about it, but I think it's hard to do much about it. It's me. Yeah, he's just about, he's almost two years out. So I'm thinking either, I, you know, I need to do something or I just need to tell him it's kind of what it's, I thought about doing an EMG, but if it, if it says L5, you know, denervation, that just tells me that I, I need to do something. So I don't know if an EMG is going to help me. Rick? I think at this point, I think the cat's out of the bag. And I don't think whatever you do is going to make any difference in, in his long-term prognosis. Um, you know, at the time of his injury, I, I think, you know, any attempt to sort of go in there and, and clean things up are not likely to make a difference. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it is that you can go dig in and find every route you want, but uh, it, it's, as John says, it's going to be a bloody mess and ultimately probably isn't going to change their prognosis ultimately. Okay. Would you guys have done anything differently in terms of order of what you did or how would, would you have managed it differently? 
No, I think the urgency was the neurological injury from the conus injury. That's what took the urgency. The pelvis needs to be stabilized and, and, and may contribute to the neurological injury, obviously, you know, from lower roots. There's going to be L5 or S1 roots, but, uh, you know, I think it's much more complex to deal with the pelvis and you can get the spine done, get it dealt with, and then over the next day or two as the dust settles, deal with the, the pelvis and sacrum. I think we we typically stage the the lumbar part. So I think you know I would have ended up with a similar looking construct, but would have just done a, a laminectomy, posterior instrumentation, you know, decompression at the very start, you know, let them cool down for three or four days, find a, an access surgeon who is available, come back, and then do the corpectomy, you know, three or four days later. I think you know you can get a pretty good decompression with ligamentotaxis and and a laminectomy. I think, you know, he had enough comminution there. I'd be concerned about his anterior column support. So I, th I think I would have done a corpectomy like you did and stick some sort of expandable cage in. So I, th I think I would have looked at more like a three-stage, you know, start with the, with the posterior lumbar, decompress, fix, you know, then come back and whether you do the pelvis next versus the um, corpectomy of his lumbar spine next would be a little bit open to OR time availability and when my other colleagues, whether access surgeon versus uh, my pelvic colleagues were available. Great. I think the advantage maybe the anterior cage is what you pointed out that your lower screws at L3, I, I might have been tempted to just put screws at L3 and 4 and not go to the front. Uh, but I think if you're not going to go to the front here, you need screws at L4, then suddenly your motion segments start to change. And if you're going to do spinal pelvic fixation at 5 or 4, yeah, you know, you're leaving you one level them. gaps, and so I think if you're if you're working to try to stop at L two for those reasons, yeah. you know the anterior corpectomy helps you, yeah. helps you create some additional support to do that. Like you said, it allows you maybe be a short segment. Yeah. Great. We can talk about uh, treatment of thoracolumbar lumbar burst fractures till we're blue in the face. So we have about six minutes. So this is real quick. Um, case three is a sixty eight year old uh, high speed MBC four years ago. He had multiple surgeries on his pelvis done at an outside institution. He had no pain-free interval, okay? He had no honeymoon period. It's not like he felt great, and then he developed pain. Pain with weight-bearing. If he's sitting for any period or weight-bearing, he's, he's feeling it. The only way he can get comfortable if he lies flat on his belly. Bow and blad ur urgency with decreased tone, which is not new for him. Um, this is from his original injury. He had five out of five in bilateral lower extremities. So this is his standing AP pelvis x-ray. So you see uh, pubic symphysis plating, maybe a little bit wide. I'm not gonna be critical of that. I don't treat this injury. Uh, maybe a little bit wide at the pubic symphysis and a transsacral S1 screw. But if you look closer here, you can, you can see this shadow. And um, I had the radiologist look at, and I have obviously from what's going on, but you see this gap in the sacrum here. So this is the CT scan that uh, I got after my first visit with him. So this is an axial through the lower uh, uh, lumbar spine and pelvis. So you see a transacral screw, but you see uh, an obvious fracture gap. And then you see gapping of the sacrum posteriorly. So again, this is L5, this is S1. You see the fracture there, transacral screw and an obvious failure of the fracture healing. Four years out, I labeled him as a, a, a sacral non-union. So I obviously did what I always do when it's not my case. I tell the patient to go back to see their surgeon. Um, so he went back to see the surgeon, had a procedure done. And then he presented to me three months later with this CT scan. So his surgeon took the transacral screw out, okay? And I'm not saying that wasn't hard because it was broken, but the patient is still having significant um, misery that's getting worse. It's limiting his activity. He just retired. He has plans to travel. Actually, um, he has a, a, a family out in Seattle, Rick. Uh, he wants to go out and see his grandchildren. So um, yeah, you just made that up. <laughs> no, I swear to God, he does. It, it's either there or Tacoma or somewhere. So treatment options, revision uh, A, revision pubic symphysis plating. Uh, that's an option. Go in and close that anterior pelvis down. You want to revise the S1 or transacral screws, uh, SI or transacral screws. Uh, you want to do bilateral iliac bolt placement with compression. Maybe if we just squeeze it enough, maybe we can um, uh, get things in a better situation 
um, get those fracture edges uh, closer together, maybe uh, rubbing and maybe lessen his pain. You wanna go posterior and do sacral laminectomies, durotomies, burr and graft the non-union with plating and or bilateral iliac bolt compression. Or do you wanna do you know, a, a very definitive surgery you can do a diverting colostomy into your approach to the sacrum, burring uh, and grafting of the non-union with plating and or bilateral iliac bolt compression. So um, Rick, I actually sent this one to you. I actually uh, asked you what, what you would do with this case. I don't know if you remember or not. Um, I, I think that you said um, you hadn't seen too many and, and good luck. Um, so it was, <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't tremendous help, but um, so, you know, usually, and, and this goes to show that these things heal predictably if you get if you line up the fractures um and typically hopefully you're not in a practice where you're going to have to deal with a lot of sacral non-unions um because they can be uh, somewhat difficult uh uh injuries to treat okay let's see where we are because we're running out of time here so this is a pretty rare i mean pretty rare, rare. See these things not heal i had a guy that's very similar and I don't think you need to open the sacrum in the front and get all the way down in there because right. it goes up into the five one disc. Yep. But what I did for this guy is I did an A lift at five one, and I exposed the bottom of five oh, nice. plate to superior end plate of S one, and I put a big femoral ring in and some BMP. So you got it to heal got the, on the top. I got to the heal across the top, and you could then turn them over and you could put screws in five, and you'd have to do this open and put a cross link and pull the two rods together left to right and, and put a cross link in that's shorter and lock it in across the back. Yeah. And uh, that's, what, that's what I did for this guy. He was a heavy smoker. He yeah. actually had tibial non-union. We took forever to heal. So everything was hard to heal in him, but I, we finally yeah. got his sacrum to heal, but I did it. I literally spanned the top of it with an A-lift graft at 5-1. Smart. And, I think and he healed, can, obviously. So you, can, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned here doing in, intentional durotomies. You know, I don't think you need to. I, I think then this one, I don't know what you did. So I, and I don't remember the phone call, but I think if you do a, a laminectomy, you can get into that fracture. You can debride it all, you know, try and try and clean out a lot of that gradu, um, then put some bone graft in there, some BMP, whatever you want, and then sort of have your, your pelvic colleagues or yourself do a transilio transsacral screw, try and squeeze it, and then put, uh, you know, percutaneous lumbopelvic fixation in. That would be what I would do for this. But I think that, you know, it's pretty easy to get into these fractures. Obviously, you, you probably don't get all the way to the front. But if you can just right. clean out a lot of it and just sort of roughen it up a little bit and get something in there. So I like your option D, but I, don't, I would leave out the intentional durotomies. I try not to do that. And that's what I did. So that I did. I did sacral. So I talked to my orthopedic traumatologist, Roger Wilber, who both of you know. Um, he said, you know, you just need spot welds in that sacrum. So um, he says, he literally said, I'll be in the next room if you need me. Uh, good luck with that. So we, we did sacral laminectomies, uh, durotomies, and um, I could, I tried to go around the sack. There's no way I could have done it because it was directly right in the middle and things were tethered. It wasn't mobile like the sack at S1 usually is. I don't see the sack at S2 or S3 that often. So there's no way I could have, because that was my intention at first, because I was even willing to take um, a couple of the sacral roots. He already had some urgency with his bowels and bladder, but I could not get to it. So I did it, tensile durotomies, both dorsal and ventral, bird the, bird the snot out of the non-union, packed some DBM in there and put these uh, bolts. Um, day one, he felt better. He went on, uh, uh, he went on to heal the fracture. Uh, CT scan shows spot welds, not, not a pure, you know, it's not all the way up and down, but enough to get uh, spot welds in uh, in that sacrum, and then we took the hardware out. So this is him. This is him now, about a year and a half after the injury, and that that big void that you see there is is no longer there in the sacrum. So, okay, we are uh, out of time. So we got to wind this down. I want to thank John. I want to thank Rick. Uh, you guys are the best. You always teach me a lot. Um, take home messages: These are devastating injuries with varying degrees of deficits. Keep in mind what Rick taught you, like any other fracture, uh, a bony fracture, we wanna reduce the fracture, we wanna get better alignment. Um, and he taught you some very good tricks on how to do that. Oftentimes, however, despite efforts, patients are often left with significant neurologic deficits. Even if I get someone completely reduced and good fixation and fracture healed, 
uh, you know, I've been doing this uh, almost 20 years, they always have some residual urgency or some significant bilateral lower extremity deficits. And you got to get a good relationship with your orthopedic traumatologist. We aren't all as good as France, who's the orthopedic traumatologist and the spine guy. So um, post-course evaluation to receive course participation, you must complete the post-course evaluation assessment and email. Um, and then again, your CME will be sent to your email address that you registered with. Uh, John, Rick, anything last minute? Oh, great cases. Good cases. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.